In chapter 10, we're going to review the properties of the different states of matter. Phase changes are when a substance breaks its intermolecular forces between particles. So the bonds, the intramolecular forces, stay together, such as in water, H2O. The H's and the O's stay together, but the bond between the separate water molecules is what is broken. So those intermolecular forces breaking are what give you these phase changes. To go from a solid to a liquid, you need to add energy. The motion of the molecules increase, and eventually you get the characteristic disorder of a liquid. As more energy is added, then the gas state will eventually be reached when the individual particles are as far apart and interacting very little, if at all. So the differences really in the three states of matter are just their relative positions to each other and the strength of those intermolecular forces. Kinetic theory of matter states that matter is composed of a large number of small particles, individual atoms or molecules that are in constant motion and the temperature is directly related to this motion of the particles. Average kinetic energy is then proportional to temperature, and this would be the Kelvin temperature that is an index of the random motion of particles. Kinetic energy is equivalent to 1 half mv squared, m being mass, v being velocity of the particle, and the average kinetic energy is directly proportional to temperature, so temperature is directly proportional to the average velocity of particles. You measure the temperature of something, you're really measuring how fast the molecules are moving on average. Objects at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy. Therefore, they have the same temperature in Kelvin. The kinetic theory of gases talks about the motion of gas particles. There are some assumptions we make. The volume of gas particles is essentially zero. The distance between them is great. The particles are in constant rapid straight line motion. The collisions of these gas particles is what causes pressure, and there are no attractive or repulsive forces between the particles. The collisions are perfectly elastic. Gases uniformly fill any container. There's a large space between the particles. They can be compressed and expanded. They exert pressure on their surroundings, and they actually are the simplest state of matter. They have no intermolecular forces, so their properties are very simple. Pressure, one of the properties that a gas has, is defined as force divided by area. The pressure of a gas is the force that the gas exerts on the walls of its container. And this pressure comes from the particles slamming in and colliding with the walls of the container. So how do gases create pressure? Well, if pressure is force divided by area, and force is mass times acceleration, then the mass of the particle times its acceleration okay, divided by the surface area on which those particles are acting. The unit of pressure okay, is derived, if we look at the first equation, pressure is force divided by area, force is mass, times acceleration, mass is kilograms, acceleration is meters per second squared, and then area is meters squared. So kilogram times meters per second squared over meters squared is the unit of pressure that we call a Pascal. There are many other standard units of pressure that you will learn to deal with throughout this chapter and several chapters down the way. You need to be able to convert from one pressure unit to another. This is as simple as using the conversion factor between the two pressure units 
and your method of dimensional analysis. If your force goes up, your force, remember, is your mass times your acceleration. So if your mass goes up, your force goes up, and your pressure goes up. So an elephant standing on your toe versus my dog standing on your toe, the elephant would cause greater pressure due to the greater force. If the surface area goes down, then mathematically the pressure also goes up. Think about someone standing on your toe in high heels versus a tennis shoe. The surface area of that heel would be quite small, creating a great deal of pressure, even if the force was equivalent. The atmosphere around us is composed of gases. The sea of gases that we live in creates pressure. These gases create pressure by slamming into everything around them at thousands of miles an hour. This is what we call atmospheric pressure. Or barometric pressure. The barometer, which measures barometric or atmospheric pressure, was developed by Torricelli, and it is a tube of mercury sitting in a pan of mercury. And as the atmosphere pushes down on the pan of mercury, it forces the mercury up the tube to a height of 760 millimeters. And this height is related to the pressure pushing down on the surface. So the mercury rises in the tube until the force of the mercury pushing down balances the force of the atmosphere that is pushing up. One atmosphere is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury and 101.3 kilopascals, or 29.9 inches. The liquid state of matter is more complex. You now have intermolecular forces holding the particles together. This is called a condensed state of matter. In an open container, the condensed state of matter will still have some vapor above it. In an open container, you would eventually get all of the liquid to evaporate. In a closed container, you would reach an equilibrium between the liquid state and the vapor above it. It doesn't mean that you would have the same number of particles. You would just have no net change any further in the amount of vapor above the liquid. This is called the equilibrium vapor pressure. Once the molecules are in the vapor state, some of them will slow down, collide, and condense back to the liquid state. You will reach, at any given temperature, an equilibrium vapor pressure for that liquid. As the temperature goes up, the vapor pressure will also go up. If the forces of attraction in the liquid are strong, then you will tend to have a lower vapor pressure. If those forces are weak, you will have a higher vapor pressure. Again, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid state. The more volatile the substance is, the higher the vapor pressure. Volatile means weaker intermolecular forces. Here in this picture, you are measuring the vapor pressure by injecting a liquid at the top of the mercury column. The greater the vapor pressure, the greater the pressure builds up in that column and pushes down on the mercury. So you can see the substance furthest to the right, the red liquid, is obviously creating a larger amount of vapor and has a higher vapor pressure, so weaker intermolecular forces. Evaporation. Molecules at the surface gain enough energy 
to break away and become a gas. This is below the boiling point, and only those molecules with high enough energy can escape the attractive forces of the surrounding liquid and break away, and these molecules are only at the surface. When these molecules break away, they take heat with them. The process requires heat energy in order to get enough energy to break those intermolecular forces. Processes that require energy are called endothermic. Since they are taking energy, they are a cooling process. Your coffee in a cup cools primarily by evaporative cooling. As the liquid turns to a vapor, that process is endothermic and takes the heat away from the remaining molecules in the cup. Condensation, then, the reverse process, releases heat energy. So now molecules in the gas state are going to interact, slow down, and become a liquid. And those with low kinetic energy are going to return to the liquid state. This process releases heat and is an exothermic or warming process. When water condenses on the outside of a cold glass or bottle, it is doing so because the surrounding water hits the cold surface, the water vapor in the air hits the cold surface of the container, loses energy, and reforms a liquid, and in the process releases heat to the glass or the bottle. Boiling is when the vapor pressure of a liquid equals the external pressure on the surface of the liquid, and pockets of vapor within the liquid escape violently. Remember, evaporation takes place on the surface, very quiet. Boiling is quite violent, and it's when pockets of vapor within in the liquid escape violently because the pressure now equals the external pressure. The normal boiling point of water at one atmosphere is 100 degrees Celsius. As we decrease the pressure, the boiling point decreases because now you don't have that strong vapor pressure building up and your molecules more readily escape and go to the vapor state. When you lower the external pressure, this requires a lower vapor pressure within the liquid, and since the definition of boiling is when the liquid vapor pressure inside matches the external, you now will have a lower boiling point. To raise the boiling point, you need to raise the external pressure, such as in a pressure cooker. The vapor pressure of the liquid increases, the temperature needs to increase to create a higher vapor, and this will raise the boiling point. Phase diagrams allow you to see what state of matter will be present at any given set of temperature pressure conditions. You have the solid state of matter, the liquid state of matter, and the gas all diagrammed out on the phase diagram. You can see the one atmosphere line. This would be at standard pressure. So your process is going from solid to liquid, liquid to gas, and solid to gas, melting, vaporizing, sublimation. And the opposite, freezing, condensing, and deposition. The fusion line, the line between solid and liquid, would be the melting point. Fusion is just a fancy word for melting. 
That line between liquid and gas is your vapor pressure curve, or vaporization line. The triple point is where all three states of matter would exist, and then you have the sublimation curve. So knowing the temperature and pressure, you can predict the state of matter that would exist. The supercritical point is the point above, that critical point, above where you can no longer liquefy a gas. You have too much energy and no amount of pressure will allow you to liquefy that gas. So you form what is called a supercritical fluid, a state of matter between a liquid and a gas. Solids, we're not going to study much about solids. In this chapter, we're dealing with crystalline solids and ionic solids for the most part. There are lots of different crystal geometries, and later on in the year when we get a chance and we're studying bonding in more depth, we may get a chance to grow some crystals. Each crystal that you grow has a particular geometry, which will tell you how it is bonded. Like I said, we're not getting into anything about that with this chapter on solids. But hopefully later on in the year, we'll be able to grow some crystals. Solids have the strongest intermolecular forces among the states of matter. They have only vibrational motion, while liquids and gases have translational motion, which means motion of particles relative to each other. The solids have only vibrational motion. Crystal structures, often called a crystal lattice. And most of your ionic solids are brittle, basically based on their attraction between positive and negative ions. And if you disrupt that, then your like charges of ions will be pushed over top of each other and cause repulsion. So solids we'll study in more depth later on. This chapter was just a nice introduction to the different states of matter.